everybody. Uh, today I am going to be putting together and eventually painting the Lord of Malice from Creature Caster. And this is their latest release. And I, although I've done several Creature Caster pieces in the past, I'd never actually purchased one from myself. But after seeing this one, I, I don't know why, I just felt compelled to pick it up and do it. Um, because I wanted to, and I don't know if I'm even going to hang on to it. I don't have a, I don't have a reason or purpose for this other than the fact that I really wanted to do it. And I figured since I'm just doing this, uh, and it's been a while since my last video, I figured this would be a good opportunity to get back into doing that as well. So, uh, if you've never done one of these pieces before, they're resin, um, but the resin that they use is really quite nice. It's um, it's got a little bit of flexibility to it, but it is not uh, it is not like that crappy GW stuff. <laughs> uh, fine cast. It's not like the fine cast resin. Uh, none of the pieces here I have seen are uh, the nothing that I've seen here is warped or bent or in need of heat to bring it back into shape. It all looks pretty much ready to go. Uh, because it's got just a little bit of softness to it, it's pretty easy to clean up, which is nice because there's a fair amount of cleanup to do. Um, but the casting looks pretty nice. It's not perfect. Uh, if we can take a look here, there's a, you know, there's a fairly decent parting line right here where the, the mold didn't quite match up. Um, it's not quite so bad on the other side, but it does exist on the other side. There are lots of these little um, gates that need to be cleared off. And essentially that's what I'm going to start with. Uh, I've got my flush cutters here. And really, it, it, it's the best way to do this. Um, these are all, these should all just cut off cleanly. And it would be really tough to do this with a knife. But when they're cleared off, you do want to trim them up. So that they're going to fit properly wherever it is they're supposed to go. And in this case, inside that little channel in the base. Uh, and then as I go through each of the parts, I can just check and make sure that if they need any cleaning, that it gets done right then. This one, surprisingly, does not appear to need anything, so that's good. And then I'll just go through and clip and clean and double check for other parting lines and then move on. Some of these are going to be bigger and maybe more difficult than others. Um, let me see what we got. Like the base here has this kind of big gnarly one. I think the real trick is just to make sure, because, you know, obviously this is just a piece of um, probably sprue from another model originally. And so it, it had a, a flat end and you just want to make sure that when you clip, you're clipping away at that flat end so that you're not screwing up the underlying detail. Uh, although that is going to be it's going to be inevitable at some point because essentially this is already filled in uh, the detail here. So there's going to be a little bit of kind of re-sculpting to do, which again, given the uh, nature of this resin, not that difficult to do. And, and in this case, I can pretty much take care of it with an X-Acto knife. But, you know, on other pieces, it might require a file. Um, or another tool in order to get the shape that you need to get done. Now this one has um, 
some light flashing and that's essentially where the uh, resin has bled out into the mo into the mold into a place where it wasn't supposed to and left just a little bit of a fine webbing of resin and that's usually pretty easy to get off as long as you know the mold didn't really open up so that that is pretty easily taken care of and otherwise this looks pretty pretty clean like although there there is this flashing there isn't really much in the way of a parting line all right so I'm gonna just gonna go through and uh, clip off the rest of these I'm not gonna use the axe so I'm not gonna bother with that piece uh, I'm gonna use the sword I've got two head choices uh, I've got this head and this head actually also has horns uh, that are here and I do like this one this is actually the the one from the painted example on their website so I'm gonna go with that one we'll set aside the other head and I think that's our only options otherwise it's all pretty straightforward so if I see anything uh, as I'm cleaning this up if I see anything that seems strange uh, I'll bring it up for example um, <laughs> this this little uh, poor spout here was originally a die which I thought was pretty funny because when I first saw it in the bag I thought what where does the die go on this uh, model but then I realized that no it was just somebody had had a die handy and they needed that to uh, to be the pour spout for the mold so anyway uh, yeah so back to it gonna go clean up the rest of this and then we'll talk about where we are see you in a bit I haven't finished cleaning all the parts off yet most of them I have, uh, but I did start doing some assembly work and I had actually gotten myself a brand new uh, tube of super glue to do this because normally a brand new tube uh, will cure really quickly, but this one has apparently been sitting on the shelf for a while, so it's not. But that does give me the opportunity to tell you about what I do in that situation these days. This is uh, a product called Bondic, and it is a it's a tube of clear uh, clear resin that comes in this little dispenser, and you know it's got the it's got the consistency of sort of a, a gel. A thin gel and it will stay in this state for a fair amount of time until you hit it with some UV at which point it cures and then you have a clear acrylic hardened um, this is being sold as an adhesive sort of I mean, really all the all of the uh, advertising for this particular product makes it seem like they want you to think it's a glue and it's not really a glue and if you look at the fine prints on all of the stuff it'll actually say it's not a glue but uh, I picked it up a while back just to experiment with it and discovered that yeah not a good glue and the reason it's not a good glue is because um, it doesn't really have a lot of adhesive properties on its own so if something is fairly smooth and you try and uh, stick it together with this it'll kind of peel right off pretty easily so you kind of need to sand both areas that you're trying to stick together but the worst part is that 
in order for this to um, to cure out, it needs to get the uh, the UV. So if you have two pieces that you're trying to glue together, right, and you got all your glue inside there, you stick these things together, the UV is never going to reach inside of there, which means it's never going to cure. So really, in order to act as a reasonable adhesive at all, you kind of have to put a shell around whatever it is you're trying to stick together so that it'll kind of skin over those pieces. And it doesn't make for a particularly strong bond. But what I have started doing is in the cases where I'm uh, super gluing something that seems to be taking too long to hold and I want to move on and I want to do something else, um, I will, for example, so the this two leg pieces attach right here and I put super glue in there, but then I went ahead and I just put a little skin of uh, the UV resin over the top of that, cured it out, and that holds this in place until the super glue cures, which means that I can move on and I can do other things. The other nice thing about this, and that is, and probably what I'm using for using it for more is just as a filler. And unfortunately, this is a terrible model to try to demonstrate this with because it doesn't really have any bad seams. But let me see if I can find an example here. So let's just say this is a bad seam right here. And you can just fill it with a little resin, you hit it with the UV, and your seam is now filled, it's cured out, you're done, you don't have to worry about it anymore. Uh, it's so simple. And this works really well on both resin uh, and uh, plastic. I've done it with um, soft plastic models. The, the final um, consistency of this resin is not terribly brittle, so you don't have to worry too much about it not having give if you need it to have that. So it's really nice. It's a, it's really helpful. And the interesting thing is when I first got this and it's, it's not been a year yet, but it's been close to a year. And, and at some point I'm going to do a full review. Uh, and that was really my initial idea was I was going to do this and do a quick review and, and move on. But the fact is that um, I wasn't that impressed and it just felt like, well, there's not really much to talk about here. I'll get to a review at some point in the future. And then as time went on, I kept finding ways to use this that seemed to go beyond what they talked about. And the thing is, it, it's a resin. So if you think about it in that respect, this is a resin and not a glue, then you can come up with all kinds of things to use it for. Uh, something else that I have been wanting to try, but haven't had uh, an opportunity yet, is you could probably use this to create rivet heads. So I just put a little dot of the stuff there, cured it out, and now I have a nice rivet, you know, or a lens on a... On a uh, on a light of some sort. Anyway, I don't want to go dive too deep into this because this isn't my review of this product. Uh, but I was using it here and I thought it was worth mentioning because I thought my super glue was going to cure out quickly and I don't have any of my uh, hardener, uh, no zip kicker on hand. So I'm having to resort to this other method for holding things together. Uh, and just real quickly, like I said, this is almost all cleaned up. I've, I've got to do this piece, um, and the head and figure out what the hell these are for. And I do think these go on the wing tips there. Uh, but something I didn't do earlier that I do need to do at some point. Oh, you know what? I could probably use that filler 
in the feet area there. Anyway, uh, is I need to wash this. Uh, this is resin, and resin frequently has a uh, mold release on it that will make it difficult for the paint to stick. And uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to wait until I've assembled most of this, and then I'm going to wash it in a little soapy water, and then I'm going to dry it, and then we'll start looking at, uh, and, at priming and stuff. So that's where we are so far. Okay, back to it. I'll see you in a bit. All right. It's ready to paint, and that means that I did finish assembly. I washed the piece once it was all assembled, and I primed it with my airbrush using Steinal Res, which, as you can see, I buy in bulk because it's my favorite primer, and especially for doing anything that's resin. Uh, I did change my mind on the head. Uh, when I finally got to look at the, the horns that came on the alternative head, I really liked that one better. So that's the one I went with, and I didn't do... I didn't do that head. So, so that's all set. So my goal is to paint this um, inspired by the look of the one that they have on their website, which is kind of a blue-gray and black. And so that's, that's the direction I'm going to go. And I don't know, it's not going to be exactly the same. There's some things I don't like about theirs, and there's... Um, things that I kind of want to do differently. But in general, it's going to follow those same basic guidelines, which of course is meant to look like that other Games Workshop-y one. So, yeah. So that's what I'm going for. Uh, the only part that I've left off of this is there's this little um, detail piece that fits in this slot back here. And I figured that was going to get in the way if I mounted that in place, and it doesn't need to be there right now anyway. So that's the only piece left off. Uh, the only thing that I pinned were these little fish hook things at the tips of the wings. Um, they were just sort of a, a butt end connection without pins. And I thought, you know what, those are going to get hooked on something and they're just going to tear right off if I don't pin them. So they got pretty hefty pins. But otherwise, this just glued together straight. Um, the model itself comes with some decent uh, pegs and holes for the pegs to fit into, so I wasn't too concerned about the rest of it. All right, so first color. I'm going to be using War Colors Blue-Gray 5. This is their darkest blue-gray. I'm going to be thinning that down with uh, this, which is actually... Uh, Createx High Performance Reducer, which works really, really well with the war color stuff. So, generally speaking, when I mix up my paint for the airbrush with the war colors, anyway, I'm going about one to one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That should be good, at least for base coats. Um, Anything after the base coat, I'll tend to go a little bit, a little bit thinner. Two, three, four, five. Now this paint is coming out really thick with big drops, so I'm not. Even though I, I'm calling this one to one, it's not like I'm getting ten drops out of this and ten drops out of the thinner because I know that the the drops from the bottle of paint equal a little bit more than the reducer. So I just mix this right in the cup. And that's not too bad. It's probably a little thicker than I'd like, to be quite honest. I'm going to go a little bit thinner. Yep, 
you kind of need to make these choices with every every mix of paint because every color is going to be a little bit different in terms of its thickness. So there, that looks about right. There we go. Okay. Now, since I already have a black base here, and I want to kind of utilize that to uh, enhance my shadows, I'm actually going to be spraying very directionally downwards. I'm not looking to cover the whole thing. I actually want some of the black to show through a bit. So I am going to keep the airbrush essentially in line with the uh, with the model. This is also going to get some lighter coats using the airbrush and some washes and some other things. So, anyway, we just need to get through this. So, I'm going to get through this. That looks pretty good. All right, for the next color, we're gonna go to blue-gray three, which is a little bit bluer than the blue-gray five, also a little bit lighter. And I have mixed this up at about two to one, two parts uh, reducer to one part paint, because I really don't want this to build up too quickly. So making it thinner gives actually gives me a little bit more control. And I'm gonna do the same thing I did last time is in terms of the angling. But I'm gonna be a little bit more careful. Because I don't, I don't want it to completely cover up everything I've got uh, underneath. And if anything, I'm going to make it even more directional.
All right, next up I got a little warm gray too. This is kind of my go-to bone color. And that's mixed up about two to one. So a thin mix. And I'm gonna be concentrating on some of the bony protrusions. Just to lighten them up. Get them more in a bone style lightness. I'm going to be going back over this, I think after this color, and bringing some contrast back into it with a black wash. Next up, I've got this black wash that I mixed up using um, five parts of airbrush medium, Liquitex airbrush medium, and one part uh, Vallejo Game Air Black. Now you could just do this with uh, Nuln Oil, but that would have the effect of bringing the whole thing down more rather than uh, sticking just primarily into the recesses. I'm gonna need to mix up some more before I'm done. Um, this mix is very much about just staying in the recesses. It doesn't, it doesn't glaze as much as uh, the shades do. So this is gonna be an overall thing for the most part. I don't think I'm gonna do it on the sword but I am going to do it everywhere else. And I don't want it to be overly thick. Because I do want it to go into the recesses, but I don't really want it to pool there. And it'll do a good job on its own of staying where it needs to be uh, without being overly pooled up. 
So you can you can spread this out some. I'm just using a big flat brush. Um, you can spread this out some without having to worry about it too much. And so this will just provide some good contrast, pop the details a little bit more. Uh, it won't darken it down too much, but it is going to darken it some. You just can't help that. And that's okay, I was planning for that. I don't know if you noticed while I was painting it that it seemed kind of light gray. And I knew that was going to be the case going in, and I knew that this black wash was going to bring it back down. It's also going to make it shiny, but that's okay. We can deal with that later. This uh, airbrush medium is not a gloss base, but it also is doesn't have any matting agent, which means that it's going to give it a pretty smooth coat, and that smooth coat is going to make it a little glossy. All right, I'm going to mix up some more and finish this off. Uh, after the black wash dried, I went ahead and went back over the bony areas with the uh, warm gray 2 to bring that color back up. And overall, this is starting to really come together, even though it's not really done or close to done. but. You know, it's starting to look more like something as opposed to nothing. And at this point, I'm going to uh, put the highlight colors on the chest and face. The, the chest and face get um, this blue-gray one, and then we'll probably work in some white after that. But it's really just in the chest area and on the face. And this is going to need to be very, very carefully done. Again, I'm going to be doing a lot of angled shooting in order to uh, get the benefit of the details of the face sort of popping out because I'm not coloring the whole thing with the airbrush. Now this is going to, especially the face, is going to require me to go back in <clears throat> and pull out details with a regular brush. but. There's no reason not to use as much of the airbrush as possible. I think I'm just going to mix a little bit of white into this and see if I can approach it that way. not bad. Yeah, it's not bad at all. I'm gonna have to put some, see if I can get some color back into this. <clears throat> it's pretty gray. I like it, but I would like to maybe introduce a little bit of blue back into it. All right, I'm gonna figure out where I'm going from here and um, I'll be back. Okay, uh, what I did is I took some of my leftover black wash and I picked out 
all the little um, bony bits that are sticking out of the chest. And then I outlined uh, some of the chest details, both in the sunken area there and just these little ridges across the chest, just to, you know, to, to bring that all out, make it pop a little bit. Uh, I also ran some into his teeth and into his eyes. Uh, we're going to come back to those later, but that sort of outlines all that stuff, makes it all, you know, ready to go. But what I did is I mixed up a little bit of a really thin batch of Blue 5 from War Colors. That's really thin. <clears throat> And I just want to see if I can tint some of this black and, and just make it a little richer than it is right now. This is really, it's like a glaze using the airbrush. And I kind of like how that's going. This just gives a little bit more richness to the black. And this is really thin. I couldn't even tell you. It's like 10 to 1, maybe. I just wanted to have have this model have a little bit more, more color to it than just gray. And it was definitely leaning in the gray direction. Uh, let's see if I can, maybe I can get some into the ch chest here. Oh, that's not bad. A little on the face. Oh, I like that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and by making it so thin, it makes it very easy to control. You're not going to accidentally go, oh, God, now the whole thing's blue. That's just not going to happen. You do want to be careful on the light area there, of course, because that could get easily oversaturated. Ooh, even bringing it into the little bony areas is nice, too. It actually helps the transition, I think. Yeah, that's looking pretty good. Next up, I think I'm going to do his eyes and his teeth, and I'm going to do that off camera because I got to get in really close, and you don't want to look at the back of my head while I do it. So I'll be back. All right, I have picked out the teeth with my bone color. I did the eyes. Really weird because they're they're big eyes, but they don't really show up very well. But still looks cool. Uh, I also went back, I took out the airbrush and, you know, went, did another pass on the bony bits again. I just like bringing that, the, the boniness back out. And every time I looked at it, it seemed like, you know, I could go a little bit farther with that. And so I did. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to work on this sword a little bit. Um... Normally, 
with something like this, I would use... Um, nope. I would use Seraphim Sepia. And I think I'm gonna... I'm not sure this is gonna work. I have this feeling that the yellow in, in this, uh, in the sepia is going to be a little much. And if that's the case, that's fine. I can go back and, uh, airbrush the bone color again. Um, I, I was going to go maybe with Agrax Earthshade instead, but you know what? This is either going to work really well or it's not. And if it doesn't, that's okay. But this this is the normal color I would use for bone. Oh, and I think actually the contrast with the bluish black is going to be kind of nice. So, good. Good. I think that's going to be okay. Now the question is going to be, do I need to work this color into any of the other bony bits on him. And I don't think so. I think having his sword be different is good. It doesn't all need to be uniform. And of course with a shade you can get a little bit more liberal in your placement. I just don't want it to pool up in here and create little windows yeah I'll blow that out in a second when I was looking at the original piece on the creature caster site their sword was one of the things I definitely wanted to change because theirs was pretty much uniform uh, between the sword and the rest of the, the bony bits. And it, that seemed like it, it made the whole piece less interesting. And pulling this out seems like the way to go. Ugh, I need to get that out of there. All right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to blow some air into there to get get it out of there and then uh let this all cure out. And then we'll come back and maybe work on the eye on the on the sword. So, be right back. I'm really bummed out right now because my hair dryer has gotten to the point where it smells like a fire hazard when I run it. <laughs> So normally I'd be able to um, uh, force dry this wash. And since I can't do that, I'm going to move on to something else real quick, or at least another wash anyway. Uh, and that is the base, uh, which I took the airbrush and just ran a little bit of warm gray three over it. The little backstop area has a little warm gray three and two. And I'm going to start with a wash of Athonian Camo Shade. I really like this for groundwork because it just, it's, it's a little brown, it's a little green. It has a little bit of life to it um, without, you know, it's not just brown. It's not just gray. It implies a bit of like, you know, moss or fungus or, you know, whatever. Um, this is looking a little green on here right now. So I will probably go over it with something else to bring the green down, depending on how it looks when it dries. But it's a good start. It's a, I like this for groundwork. There'll probably be some dry brushing in here as well. So if it ends up looking excessively green, that's gonna, we can deal with it. That's fine. I'm not sure I'm gonna put it on the little backstop though. I might. 
I guess I can and then decide if I like it. And again, no hair dryers at the moment. I'm gonna re be replacing that. In fact, I'll probably order a new one tonight. But it was only just today that it started making really scary noises. It, it had actually been making scary noises on the high, high um, setting. So I just stopped using the high setting and just was using the low setting, even though it took a little longer to, to do things. It's like, eh, I'm fine. It works out okay. And then it started making those noises on the low setting and it started smelling funny. Very ozone-y smell. And I'm like, you know what? This is probably dangerous. I should probably not use this thing anymore. And I had already had a, like a heat gun picked out that can do bo double duty both as a... Uh, uh, a dryer because it has a has a cooler setting as well as doing you know crazy melty stuff with it And so I just need to order that so that parts done and Let's do this I really do like this camo shade. I think both of uh, the um, seraphim sepia and the Ethonian camo shade are my two favorite uh, shade colors from this line and I think they're the two kind of most unlikely favorites I know everybody's into the browns and the blacks but I like my green and my yellow Yeah, the Seraphim Sepia, I use that a lot for all kinds of different things. I think at this point I use it more than the uh, Agrax Earthshade, which is a good color as well. But I find it too blah, too regular, too uninteresting. At least on its own. All right, I'm gonna let that set, and I'll be back in a bit. Okay, let's do the sword eye, and I'm just gonna start with a little four colors green too. That one you're going to need to build up a little bit there. It's a it's a fairly transparent color. I'm going to get some of this out of, here, out of the edges. Or move more into it, you know. Either way. There we go. Get the other side here. need to get a couple of coats on there but I'm gonna need to let this dry I'll do another coat and then come back okay now I'm gonna use a little olive too the olive is much more yellow as you can see right there and I'm just gonna dot this towards the center there It's not really a dot, I guess. And it's also going to need a couple of uh, a couple of coats to get it to cover properly.
All right, we'll be back. All right, there it is. Eyeballs on either side. And then I got started on doing a little detail work on the sword blade. And all I did is I went back and got some of the uh, warm gray. And it's thinned out. And I am just adding some highlights to the edge just to make it pop a little bit more. And it it both makes it feel more sharp, but it also doesn't make it, it, it makes it look more like bone as well. Um, it looks kind of rough hewn, which I like. And I'm going to finish doing that off camera because it's kind of a pain in the butt. Again, need to get it close. Let's see. Just focus. There we go. So yeah, I'm going to do more of that. Didn't do any on this side yet, so I got to do both sides. And uh, and then we're going to be close to done here, I think. Got to do the base. Uh, the oh, as long as we're talking about the base. That Athonian camo shade wash actually turned out really nice. Uh, I'm going to do some highlighting on that. And maybe a little dry brushing on this. Not too much left there, because I, I mean, the wash just came out really nice. Sometimes, sometimes it just works and you don't have to do much more. I might take the airbrush to it a little bit. I don't know yet. I just don't know. I'll figure it out. I'll be back. All right, I've decided that I am going to put a little bit of my base coat back over this. Oh. And uh, I just want to make it a little bit brighter. And this will get rid of some of the contrast. It'll get rid of some of the... inherent look of of the shade you know that look you know that look it gets but I'm, I'm putting this on very lightly I want the majority of the uh, brightness to be up in these spines and I'm gonna do a little bit lighter color up there as well but look at see that already so here is unadulterated there and that's with just a little bit of the airbrush so I think this is gonna do what I want it to do you still get you still get some of the contrast but you lose a little bit of the uh, you lose a little bit of the stained the stained look. All right, so that is that color. And then I'm going to go, I'm going to skip up to warm gray one, which is almost a white. And that's just going to be on the spines. And I'm going to, I'm going to really just concentrate on the tips and let it feather down naturally. Alright, I think I'm going to feather it down just a little bit more. There. Well, that's got a little bit of a pop, and that should show up nicely behind the demon. And now I think I'm just going to go in with some... some grays and uh, just dry brush this a bit. I've got my nice flat brush here. And 
And I think, I think we'll use, let's go use the cool gray, cool gray one. And just get these rocks to pop a little bit. Going against the grain, you know, the, the grain is going this way, so I'm going the other way. All right, I'm gonna go do the rest of this off camera. Be back in a bit. And there it is. Uh, as you can see, it's not shiny anymore, at least not really shiny. There's a bit of shininess in the wings that I don't mind, but uh, for the most part, it's gone. Like, primarily I was worried about the legs and the arms. And that was done using Liquitex uh, no, not airbrush medium. This is the, oh, there it is. The matte varnish, which is by far the best uh, matte coating I've ever used. Um, with the possible exception of the old flow quill figure flat, which you can't get anymore. Um, yeah, this stuff works really well, both uh, with the brush and with the airbrush. And you just need to make sure you mix it up really good before you use it, because it will separate. But I like the final result here. This is not uh, a super hyper detailed paint job. It wasn't meant to be. The 40K slash fantasy character that this is meant to be. Um, the kind of the GW paint job is essentially this. There are different directions you could go with this. Like for example, the um, the creature caster version of this is much bluer overall. Uh, I actually like having a little blue in here, but I also think that there's a little bit more of a realistic feel to the direction that I went with it. And I also like the fact that my sword is definitely a different overall tone from his uh, bony protrusions. I like the base. It, it blends well with the rest of the piece. It doesn't insist on itself. Uh, and there's certainly, you know, other directions you could go with that. Obviously, if you were going to use this as a playing piece, you want to mount this on whatever size base you think this is going to need. And then you can, you know, build up around it and do more with it. But for the purposes of what I was doing, I think this is perfectly fine and not overly difficult to do. Uh, I think one of the things that surprised me is how much airbrush and how little actual paintbrush uh, I used on this because really the paintbrush was just the the overall wash uh, some of the point washes like in the eyes and the teeth um, the shade on the base and the sword and then painting the eyes on the sword, the, the little bit of uh, detail work on the sword edges, you know, sort of edge highlighting as well as the, um, the highlights. And then, of course, the, uh, his facial bits. But otherwise, I mean, this is really mostly airbrush, which is kind of, kind of cool, actually. But anyway, uh, I'm going to go take some pictures, which uh, you will see very shortly. And anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you got something useful out of this video, as always. So take care. Have a great day. 
and I'll see you in the next video, which will hopefully not be long in coming. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye.